What is your biggest challenge and differences with the religion of Islam? Well, you know, probably the main thing is the sanctification of violence in the stances. Like Rashid here is an ex-Muslim, and so under Islamic law, as it's traditionally and classically formulated, he would be put to death. I actually would be also under a death sentence just for drawing Muhammad. Not in order to cause gratuitous insult, but to defend the freedom of speech and freedom of expression, which is the foundation of any genuinely free society. There's slavery in the Bible. There's punishment for blasphemers in the Bible. There's killing of heretics in the church tradition. There's no discussion of that with Matt Walsh, right? Or when Robert wants to criticize Islam, I'm wondering, is that criticism on the basis of the Bible? Is that on the basis of the church tradition, or is this a liberal, secular, modernist critique of Islam? So I want to know, am I debating or discussing with uh, two Christians or two atheists or two liberal secularists? Like, that's a clarification that we need. Tradition within Christianity that holds that Old Testament law applies to Christians for all time. As a matter of fact, it never did apply. The rabbis redefined Judaism so that even they don't teach that those punishments have ongoing validity. Do you believe that it's inherently immoral for an apostate to be put to death? So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I tell you that. don't even know if this is inherently immoral. That's quite shocking, no, Robert. I would say that I don't think that it's moral to put the apostate to death. Deuteronomy, since you like to quote the Quran, when the Bible says this in Deuteronomy 13, 6, if your brother, the son of your mother, your son of or your son of your daughter, the wife of your bosom or your friend who as as your own soul secretly entices you saying, quote, let us go and serve other gods, which you have not known, neither you nor your your fathers, of the gods of the people which are all around you, near to you or far from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, you shall not consent to him or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to, to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people, and you shall stone him with stones until he dies because he sought to entice you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So all Israel shall hear and fear, and not again do such wickedness as this among you. Yes. So when, let me, let me finish. Let me oh, comment I get on your the point. passage. So when your loving God, Jesus Christ, who you believe is God, who revealed the Old Testament and revealed this as a law for the people, and you said that it's inherently immoral for a, the punishment of apostasy to be death, then you are charging your own God and supposedly loving Jesus with immorality. Do you believe I should be put to death? In a correct Islamic state is death. I I'm think. not the one that executes With proper it. due process, with a proper court hearing, just like any nation of laws, an apostate like you would be killed. Yes. Okay, thank you. And according okay, to the let Bible me, as let well. me, let me, this is a fallacy. And a blasphemer. This so. is a fallacy. Robert, Too cock we. Like, you want to say not you have it too. It's a fallacy. <laughs> no. Let us discuss this because uh, no, it's, our, a fallacy. Our, it's a fallacy. It's, it's let, showing, me, it's let, let me finish. Let me finish. Explain. Let me finish. Jesus came and he stopped the Old Testament. He stopped every... He so there are a lot of inaccuracies in what he's talking about. I want to reframe the issue because he's saying that his life is in danger. But the lives of Muslims are in danger under a secular, liberal hegemony. And I know that some of the viewers might not be following what I'm discussing, but look at the war on terror. The idea of the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan were completely wrong, com based on false premises, false assumptions, uh, based on the idea that they could bring democracy to the Islamic world. It was never going to happen. I was warning about it. But the Bible, the problem that you have is, the same one that you want to talk about, the loving Jesus Christ himself, which we also adore and respect as a prophet, is the same one that you believe is God and revealed the Old Testament. And you can't get out of that. So when your God, Jesus, revealed at that specific time, as I just read the passage, and I can read you plenty more where he says to kill babies in war. Is it okay to target infants in war and kill babies? Is that inherently immoral? You have 
have two options. If you condemn it as inherently immoral, then the whole Bible's gone. Because if you believe that those Bibles were, that those verses in the Bible were revealed by God, then you're saying that God is immoral. And on the other hand, if you say that it's not inherently immoral, but God changed the law at this time, then most of your arguments lose the force that they have against Islam because you can no longer argue that it is inherently immoral to punish an apostate by death and all of the other things that you want to tack on. If you can get rid of the conquest and the violence and the punishment for apostasy, why not just get rid of the prohibition of like cross-dressing, the prohibition of homosexuality, the prohibition of drag queens? Why prohibit any of that? Like You're making a very good argument. Very simple notation of the Gospels, the Gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, in the Christian faith, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were inspired, but that doesn't mean that God was dictating to them and that it was beyond their human understanding. Like when St. Paul, in one of his letters, and he says, I'm glad I didn't come to baptize any of you. Well, actually, I did baptize a couple people, and I forget who else, but I still didn't come to baptize. It's not that God is forgetting who he baptized and who he didn't, but Paul is working from his human understanding, and yet he is speaking the truths, the eternal truths that God wants him to communicate. A lot of the Bible is the record of the evolving understanding of the people of God about precisely I see a lot of these issues that you're talking about. His disciples never they didn't waged... have political power. As soon as Christians the, gained the, political power the, in the Roman the, Empire, they started doing these okay. things. You they didn't have the jurisdiction to do so. You, they didn't kill They were anybody. the minority. No, no. They weren't in power. No, no, as no, soon the, as Christians gained power the, within the Roman the, Empire, they, the, they applied the Old Testament the, laws. First Samuel 15, 1 to 3. And Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, Israel. Not, oh, I'm just talking at it, you know, my backside. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Who are they? They're the words of the Lord. They're not the words of Samuel or your neighbor John or whoever else. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, <coughs> ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Donkey. So do not tell me, sir, that God, Jesus, did not order the killing of innocent people. He Not only did he do that, he ordered the killing of babies, none of which you will ever find anywhere in the Quran or Sunnah. If you have a problem with God ordering death for apostasy and all these other things that you're bringing up, Robert, when you bring up the issue of Paul, well, he's trying to remember how many people he baptized. Is that analogous to this text where a prophet Samuel is explicitly saying that these are the words of the Lord? Was Samuel lying? Did God actually say this? And if so, is killing babies inherently immoral when at war? Yeah, killing babies is bad, Jake. Yes. Is it inherently immoral? Yeah. So why did your God order why the... Did Jesus why did, order it? Why did no, your see, God, Jesus, the problem command... You have, order it. The, why did your God, the problem Jesus, you have command once again, the killing of infants? If you, and some people would say, actually, these things never happened at all. They were fables designed to teach Look. that Samuel 15, 1 to 3, was revealed by God and that God himself ordered directly, intentionally, for the killing of babies and infants. Let me answer that. Let me answer that. You are judging a war that happened 3,000 years ago it, by the standards of today. Did that the prophet, peace be upon him, uh, explicitly forbade the intentional killing of women and children in the hadith that you didn't mention. So this is dishonest. Exactly. You read one hadith from the book of jihad in Sahih Muslim, but you don't read the other hadith. Exactly. So that is dishonest on your part. So why I left Morocco. I love Morocco. I would love I would love to live among my family, but I left not because of the economy. I was doing well. But because I don't have freedom of religion, at age of 16, 17, then I had to um, leave my family, actually. They rejected me. I lived as a homeless for two years, and I had to live underground with the Moroccan church, the converts, until 2003, uh, 2005, I had to flee the country.
2005, you have to flee the country. Yeah. Okay. Every, everything we are enjoying today, it came from the West. For example, women's rights came from the West. Uh, uh, abolishing slavery came from the West. Uh, freedom of speech, freedom of religion came from the West. Uh, you name it, just give me anything. Dem democracies came from the West. So w do you want us to live under an authoritarian uh, system and you cannot even question it? And if you say anything against it, you will be. So we are enjoying freedom of speech, freedom of religion, democracy. We can say our opinion. We can have a podcast like that without a problem. Guess what in Morocco? When I became a Christian, we met as Christians in closed doors. We couldn't sing. We couldn't baptize people. We couldn't name our kids Christian names. You cannot name him Luke or Mark or anything. You have to name him Muhammad and Omar and Abu Bakr. You can't name them Christian names. This is not I, true. It's true. I lived it. It's not. I lived it's, in it. Islamic law. You, okay. Do you know Ahyam Ahlul Dhimma? Do you know the principle? I'm not Ahlul Dhimma. I'm an apostate. Yeah, you don't talk about other Christians. Well, Christians can name their children. Okay. You lived in. Uh, okay, let me finish. I am a convert <laughs> from Islam to Christianity, That's and different. I had, I had different. hundreds like me, girls and boys. They were we were gathering. We were afraid of police, and we got arrested. The next side on. Let me just add a little bit to God, it. Go for it. I will be killed, my kids will be taken, and my wife will be taken, add, just to add to the list, in, in, a, in an Islamic system. <clears throat> the Old Testament and the New Testament, as I said before, are records of an evolving understanding among the people of God. And that because of that evolving understanding, they came to realize that these things had no applicability for all people for all time. The uh, idea that the Old Testament is not applicable for Christians is in the New Testament itself. That's actually a large preoccupation of the New Testament, that they are free for, the Christians are free from the law. And so you Catholicism and Orthodoxy, you have the apostolic succession and the authority of the bishops <laughs> who can authoritatively interpret the scriptures mm -hmm. and set the doctrines, and yeah. those doctrines have been consistent from the beginning. Personally, we believe that Christians, Trinitarian Christians, are representing a veiled form of polytheism. And you claim that this was the consistent message over time. Well, let's see what Justin Martyr, your own saint, says. He's in the beginning of the second century. He was born in the year 100. In his famous dialogue with Trifo, chapter 56, he says this. Let's see if his theology is the same as yours, Robert. I shall attempt to persuade you, since you have understood the scriptures of the truth of what I say, that there is, and that there is said to be another God and Lord subject to the maker of all things, who is also called an angel because he announces to men whatsoever the maker of all things above whom there is no other God wishes to announce them. So Justin Martyr says that Jesus is a second God, is another God, separate and distinct, and he is a lesser divinity. Now John Baer, who I'm sure you would know is a famous uh, Eastern Orthodox authority today, he comments on this passage and he says this, as it is not God himself who thus appeared and spoke with man, the word of God who did all of these things for Justin, quote, another God and Lord besides the maker of all, who is also called his angel as he brings messages from the maker of all, above whom there is no other God. Then he says about this passage, the divinity of Jesus Christ, another God, is no longer that of the Father himself, but subordinate to it a lesser divinity trying to and I can go through a whole more list of on key doctrines like the doctrine of the incarnation the atonement and the trinity itself that the early church authorities like Justin Martyr Irenaeus Tertullian and on and on up into the fourth century never preached the doctrine of the trinity sir so when you make the claim that your message has been consistent without what well, we see in the very beginnings on the fundamental point of who God is, you did not have the same doctrine. It took to get to the fourth century, and that's why 
Christianity, because at its very beginning, was very comfortable with development. Oh, who is God? Is a man God? Is he God and man at the same time? So if you can have those sorts of developments, of course you can have developments about how laws are applied and whether or not we should be celebrating LGBTQ and all of that. That's your history, sir. That in the first 300 years of the church, you do not have a single church father, whether it be Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, if you want to go to Tertullian although some people think he's just a church writer, down through the line up until the 4th century, they did not teach the doctrine of the Trinity, and I will defend that position anytime, anyplace. Yeah, the, the enemy uh, is anyone who threatens um, freedom, our freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and um, anyone who is trying to kill the ones who are um, different than his religion or his thinking or his way of thinking. So... Um, uh, any worldview that will threaten my freedom, my uh, uh, way of life, my way of changing, choose uh, today to be a Christian tomorrow, a Jew tomorrow, an atheist, uh, anything that will threaten that my choices and will force me just to follow one way, I will consider it an enemy. When it comes to Islam, the biggest enemies defined in the religion is number one, Satan. Um, because he tempts people and takes them off of the straight path. Um, then what's called dunya, which is like the worldly life, which is a delusion, the life to come, the afterlife. That is the true reality. Dunya. Dunya, exactly. <laughs> so we have to be focused on God and worshiping him and being on the straight path. And then also our desires like lust that will cause us to commit sins. And then also our ego, which is called nefs. The ego, which tells us that we're greater than God, that we are more important and that we are better than others just because we are who we are. These are the four spiritual enemies of humankind. And then in terms of a worldly perspective, I would say liberal secularism is the biggest enemy to all traditional people, Muslim, Christian, and it is the world power today. But your so work they is work racist, into though. Your work is racist. That's a lot of hooey. Your, your site calls for investigation of me, like his site. He for is you? called to investigate me. Yeah. On his site, dedicated just to me, that <clears throat> I need to be investigated because I don't agree with LGBT. May I respond? On his site. The thing about Robert Spencer, and I'm glad that he brought up this issue of racism, he is a racist. Like his site, anytime a Muslim anywhere or any Middle Easterner doesn't have to be a jihadi or doesn't have to be a Muslim even, commits a crime, he puts it on his site and says, oh, jihadi, Islamic terror. And he creates this fear mongering against immigrants. And imagine if you had a site dedicated to whenever a Jewish person committed a crime, you say, oh, Judaic violence and you called your site Jew Watch, or anytime a black person committed a crime, say, oh, Black Watch, this is black terror, this is black crime. That's what he does to Muslims, and he's had a long career <clears throat> of this. He was involved in the same counter-terrorism -terror uh, work with the Republicans that he's now decrying and saying, oh, yeah, I disagree with that. You are a part of that effort. You are a part of those administrations. I did, it, it, I did advise the FBI when I was invited. I advised the FBI uh, and military groups, CIA a couple times, absolutely, yes, who were trying to change the point of view of the higher-ups, and that's why I got in. Yeah, so, I, that, so that, would now, you accept with a site called Jew Watch? Answer that. It's not an analogy. That's it's why you call for I my believe, investigation. <laughs> I I'd like to go to the next phase. But Here's, I think you should be, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'd like, I'd like, I agree. I'd like, there you go. I'd like